All right, so this is going to be our part two of the lecture on Japanese gardens. Last class, you know, I was going to give you guys the assignment, but then I figure it's better to first finish the uh, the complete lecture because we are discussing different types of gardens, uh, including uh, sand gardens, straw gardens, tea gardens, and, uh, and hill gardens. So it's better to finish everything, get all the idea clear, and then we can discuss, you know, uh, your presentation on one of these gardens for the following uh, for the following class, which is the twenty first of uh, yeah, of, uh, and then the class afterwards, there's a month is a Wednesday follows a Monday schedule, so we don't have class the following you know after that time. All right, so before we start, you know, uh, what do you guys think of Japanese gardens up to now? You know, all these things we've been discussing in the class. Do you find them to be interesting? Are you getting any new ideas for the way that you see gardens, you know, uh, let's say in, in here in the Western culture? Ideas for I your personal it, design projects? Go ahead, yeah, sorry. I find it pretty interesting. Uh, I've never thought about the flexibility yes. in gardens and how you can design them. I've always thought of it in like the Western aspect. So I feel like in terms of future designs and, you know, just overall, like it's giving me new ideas. So I I find it pretty interesting. Okay. Definitely that the design part is the, you know, what makes it unique, you know, especially in all parts of Japanese uh, architecture. I mean, if we, if we compare them to, let's say, European gardens, which are very different, right? Uh, they're, you know, symmetrical. Uh, they're very colorful. Uh, they have different types of uh, patterns in the gardens. So these gardens, you know, European ones, uh, you know, let me do a quick search over here. If, you know, if you look at these gardens here, like this, you know, this is completely symmetrical for the most part, right? Uh, you know, we have four trees there. Uh, you know, we have typically a large play of uh, of kind of these elements here where you can kind of, you know, um, shape the garden to uh, to show different figures. But again, these figures are pretty defined, right? So it's, there's not really abstraction to those gardens. Uh, they're pretty symmetrical, right? So there's always kind of a, a maze effect to the gardens. Uh, yes, they they follow the idea of the architecture because the buildings are also very uh, symmetrical in European uh, gardens. They're very colorful, right? Uh, uh, that's something that they have, you know, that definitely in Japan, we don't have this. Some gardens, the ones that are more modern and they they are influenced by Western culture, yes, they have more flowers. But mostly European gardens are like this, you know, mazes, symmetrical, uh, lots of uh, uh, flowers, lots of color, right? And kind of very architectural in the sense that they relate to the building structure of a very strong grid, symmetrical features uh, in the same way of the building. And then we go back to Japanese gardens, which are for the most part neutral, abstract, right? And leave almost everything to the imagination, right? Uh, you know, why? Because, uh, you know, Japan, it has uh, not too much actually space for building, right? So if you're looking for a flat space for a garden, there's really not too much. Most of the uh, Japan is just mountains. Uh, unlike Europe, that there's plenty of space to make vast gardens so they can explore more. So Japan is always trying to um, create miniatures of other landscapes. It could be uh, distant mountains, uh, uh, distant land masses, and just shrink it and make it part of their view so they can capture everything as a very abstract painting. Right? Of course, those things are not really uh, important in, in European gardens because there's just so much space, right? And you can see everything at once. So that's one of the key things that are, you know, fairly different, you know, in the gardens. So last class, you know, we covered, you know, uh, you know, some basic ideas of gardens. Today, I want to uh, finalize by giving kind of more examples of uh, those four key garden types and kind of where they they started. You know, going back to like the sand garden, uh, the tea gardens. Uh, there's the uh, hill gardens and then straw gardens that we have. But, you know, again, I don't want to make this class into a history class, but I do want to give a very, you know, basic uh, analysis of uh, that progression of, of uh, the gardens in Japan uh, from, you know, very early, you know, early times. And then we go into detail looking at, uh, you know, those four different garden types. And later we'll discuss, you know, uh, the actual assignment. And we'll look at some samples from last semester to see kind of what I expect from you guys to present in the next class. All right, any other uh, comments or questions? No? Okay. 
All right, so let's get started here. Let's uh, maximize this thing here. Make sure everybody can see okay. I want this view. Slideshow, yes. Why am I getting this over here? Sorry. And the slideshow. I'm gonna make it the full screen, but I don't wanna see that little sidebar. Reading view, slideshow. Okay, but it's going. Maybe put present rather than slideshow. Yeah, cause I, uh, yeah, because I have three three screens, so it looks like a, uh, okay, it's going to my main screen, which is my left one. Yeah, uh, that's why. Okay, give me one second. What I'll do here, I'm going to uh to stop share. I'm gonna share from my left screen, so it'll be easier for you guys to see. And I need to organize my screen. So, guess we'll do screen number two. There, and then we'll do. Uh, let's see here at this. All right, can you guys see the whole slide now? Over here? Uh, yeah, it's kind of cut off. It's cut off. Uh, so you're looking at the... My, can you see the title, and the picture is like one little rectangle on the left-hand side. Ah, that was weird. Okay, let's I try. I see a fine. I'm not sure if it's just him. Okay, okay, let's try again. Okay. Let's try. Um... So, okay, so right now you're looking at, at uh, these gardens, right? The European gardens on the left screen. Yeah. At least my, you are right. Okay, so I'm going to do a presentation. So right now you should be looking at, at the, a full slide. In yeah, screen. that's much better. That's better, yes? Okay, yeah. perfect. Okay. All right, so let's go through uh, through here. So let's go a little bit of a, you know, kind of a progression of uh, of the Japanese garden. So. So this this I won't take too long, but you know, going back to in Japan, it you know has uh, different periods, right, of history, and all these periods, you know, are typically established by, you know, the emperor, right, and in how long he's been there, or, uh, so you know, the first one is kind of the you know the first document, documented one is the Jomon period. So, and looking at, at the gardens, you know, everything is very primitive, right. So, uh, being simply you know uh, farmers, the gardens really don't have any structure. Uh, they're just there for the basics, which is just, you know, plants uh, and just gardening. So these gardens, you know, have a very close uh, link to nature. And, you know, in the beginning, they kind of look like this, right? So they're just kind of huts that are buried into the ground, right? Uh, they're buried there because, you know, it creates a, a little bit of a cooler space for living. Uh, and again, they're just part of the actual landscape. They're almost like hills or mountains in the garden. But there's no thinking about, you know, uh, ponds or sand or or tea ceremony or tea garden. This is way too early. This is just uh, just kind of farming uh, at its most simple stage. Then it goes to Yayoi period, right? 300 BC. The, uh, and this, you know, gardens are, you know, Japan is now introduced to rice farming, right? So the rice paddies, you know, uh, uh, cultivating rice, you know, this lifestyle creates, you know, um, uh, the creation of fields, you know, and these fields, you know, are, are used, you know, of course, to, uh, to you know, to grow rice, which is Japan's, uh, you know, staple. Uh, some of the buildings maybe are more elevated because the rice paddies typically are over water, and we start to create the idea of ventilation. So this idea of having things elevated, is, it happens even now in Japan, and in most traditional buildings, the building is floating over the ground because, you know, um, to allow for air to move to the building, to allow for, you know, circulation, because Japan is very hot, it's very humid, so it's it's you know, important to separate the building from other parts. So again, this garden also really uh, has the only structure is still just farming, right? Nothing that relates to aesthetics or or sand or beauty, or or meditation. It's just simply uh, functional use of of uh, gardening, right? Then we go to the uh, Kofun uh, period, right? So this is influenced by burial mounds. So at this point, you know, uh, you know, uh, large creation or large kind of islands to bury is the emperor. Uh, these are not really gardens, you know, they're more like massive landscape elements uh, like this, right? Where they shape the entire space. Uh, and over here is a burial mound, right? In the in the center for somebody, you know, obviously very important, but there's still no idea of the uh, the Zen philosophy, right? These things that we uh, we focus too much today. 
then we have the you know, uh, so here during the Asuka and Nara period is where we start to see architecture and gardens, right? So uh, Buddhism rise arrives in Japan from China, right? Uh, and because of Buddhism, they start to construct temples, uh, and these temples temples start to be associated with gardens, right? Uh, to most important to create a harmony between nature and building, right? These ideas came from Chinese gardens, right? Their Chinese uh, uh, influence. And we get buildings like this, you know, this is the, um, uh, this is in Nara, right? And this is a, a massive building. You can see, uh, this is the, a person over here, right? Very tiny, this is massive. And inside the building, it's actually all open. It just has one huge Buddha that is massive in, in size. And that's all focusing on a shrine, uh, housing, you know, a, a Buddhist statue, right? Uh, a big Buddha. And the gardens there are just open space to highlight the architecture right, of the building. These buildings are also because they're very early on in the design, they're influenced by Chinese architecture, which means that the details, you know, of the curved roofs here, the use of gold here, all the very intricate shapes here are coming directly from China. Another example is this building here. Right? Uh, again, curved roofs, the color red, and these are more shrines. Uh, so temples are almost like like this, right? Typically, you know, gray and brown and white. Shrines are red, you know, and these are the, this is the, the closest example to Chinese architecture. Uh, you know, Ch Japanese design doesn't really use red. It's very neutral. So in the beginning, having the Chinese influence, they brought all these things to the architecture. And they also brought, you know, uh, these gardens that are trying to highlight the buildings because they reflect the building in the garden. So they make it more uh, monumental, right? And they'll feature typically ponds, islands, plantings. Uh, and this is kind of the, the start of, you know, other ideas of Japanese gardens. From here, we go to the Heian period, right? Here. So Heian period, you know, has a, a big influence on, on garden design, right? Uh, one very famous building is the Byodo Inn Temple, and I'll give you an example soon. But it has ponds uh, to to really emphasize the building here. You can see here, right, this has a massive pond in front to reflect back the architecture into the uh, into the water, right? You see again the curved roofs. So if you see curved roofs, if you see red, then it's, it's, it'll be a shrine, right? And this is just meant to highlight uh, the building, right? So these buildings, again, these gardens are not really small enough for meditation, right? They're more to showcase the architecture and make it look more monumental. Then we go to the Kamakura period, right? Of Japan, right? So this, if you see here, there's a shift from arist aristocracy to samurai rule, right? And Sen Buddhism, right? So Sen Buddhism is what starts the whole phase of Garden being used for meditation, right? Gardens uh, become very abstract. Uh, it, it all emerges during this period, right? Uh, and it starts to shape, you know, a much smaller size garden that strives to uh, to mimic other landscapes in the area. In this, in these ones here that we saw before, these are not meant to mimic anything. They only they're meant to to highlight the architecture. When here we focus on a much smaller space. So things like this, you know, a very simple garden, very small, that is framed by the landscape, by the building. They have some idea of, uh, you know, of rocks or maybe a uh, water shore. So it starts the idea of abstraction in the gardens. Then we go to the uh, Muramachi period, right? And this is influenced heavily by Zen Buddhism, right? And Zen Buddhism, now we talk about meditation, right? Relaxation, minimalist, right? a very meditative approach to the garden. And this is when we get uh, gardens like uh, Ryuanji, which is the, the uh, sand garden, something like this, which is pretty much uh, the most simple garden that can exist, you know, with plenty of open space, some idea of mimicking other landscapes or mountains, right? A control of the environment uh, past uh, the, the gates, right, or the wall here, and a space where you can look on for hours and just kind of meditate and relax, right? And this starts to deal with the, the Zen idea of meditation and simplicity in life, right? These gardens are meant to uh, to hide all the complexity of life into a very simple space where you can go there 
And just by looking and letting your eye kind of float, be able to relax, right? And meditate, right? From any other, you know, stress you might have, for example. Then we go to the Asuchi Momayama period, right? So there's when we have uh, the idea of tea culture, right? So again, there is some influence from China, right? Uh, and we get the cha no yu. Cha no yu is simply tea culture in Japanese, right? And this leads to the creation of tea gardens, which are called cha niwa. Uh, and these are simple gardens, right? Uh, that the uh, the person going to drink tea can enjoy uh, in their way to the actual tea house or tea room. And these are, again, even smaller, right? The gardens and the other ones. Very simple. They will typically have, you know, uh, stepping stones that give you the path where you're going, right? They're they're always trying to uh to be a wall or something to try to keep them as a separate element from the rest of the building. And for the most part, they're just meant to look natural, right? Even though you know this rock is there, that was placed there, it should look like it was just happened to be nature like that. Like this is how nature made it, and without any influence from the actual designer. And it's typically all green, right? There's no flowers. Uh, there might not be even any any flowering trees or autumn trees. It's simply just green and a lot of moss, right? And definitely rocks to emphasize uh, other features. It could be mountains or animals that can be found in the space. Also, as for the architecture, you can see here, this is leading to a tea, uh, tea house over here, a very small one. And you can see even the structure of the tea house here remains uh, with a column that is simply curved, right? And it still has the bark. So from inside, when you look out, it looks like you're looking across some trees. So it looks very natural. That's a very simple uh, here. You know, here's the, the rock garden. We have the stepping stones, a very simple, natural looking uh, landscape. Some type of wall here, in this case, more porous to uh, to separate from the other parts. And then we have here the entrance to the, uh, the tea house, right? So you have a sitting area that could be for waiting. Uh, a very, in this case, a control view here of the garden through a frame, but overall very simple, right? In design. Then we got the you know the Edo period. So the Edo period now goes into the 1600s and 1860s. So that's the time when Japan opened to the uh, Western culture. So they had uh, boats or ships, you know, arriving here from Europe, uh, bringing European you know, uh, ideas of design. This included, you know, technology, uh, fashion, uh, you know, uh, what else? Uh, and of course, bringing the idea of, uh, of European gardens, which are pretty much straw gardens that you can go there and just walk and enjoy. You know, these gardens uh, feature paths, ponds, bridges, and they also try to imitate different landscapes. So something like this uh, only arrived after we had the Western influence in the Japanese gardens. And we can see here that, uh, you know, it's a take in Japanese sense, right? It's not really symmetrical, right? Uh, it's fairly abstract. The gardens are still meant to mimic other landscapes. So you have definitely plenty of mountain shapes or plenty of hills or very nice curvy elements in the gardens. Why? Because they're very uh, natural. You don't see here any straight paths or or rectangular looking ponds or pools. Everything is, is, is um, it's soft, you know, and curvy. The only part that links to the Western culture is the idea that you can now walk through these gardens and explore them, right? In a very simple way. So these are now known as straw gardens. And they mix, you know, Western culture with Japanese uh, ideas of views. Uh, these gardens, uh, unlike Western gardens, when you walk here, you have designated spots where you can stop and you can look, right? Because, you know, so we, since you have these hills here happening throughout here, when you walk them by, it's a nice view, but at certain spots of the path, you're meant to stop and look, right? And then you get the perfect view of the landscape. Another very famous straw garden is the Katsura Villa, right? This is one of Japan's most famous kind of straw gardens. And it has, you know, it's a bit more complex. It has a lot of bridges and paths leading to different areas here. And those different areas try to capture different scenes of Japan, right? It could be mountains. It could be the shores of the, uh, the ocean, the shores of Lake Biwa. And you know the guests can actually come through here, and they have several tea houses on site where you can go out there have tea, then keep walking and enjoying other parts of the uh, of the gardens. 
These are typically very elaborate gardens. Uh, the water here is always very shallow because these gardens tend to work with having koi, you know, the fish. So this way you can always see the fish uh, moving through the water, uh, unlike being kind of very deep in other gardens. And then we have, you know, uh, Meiji Restoration, which we're currently in that period in Japan. This started in 1868, right? Uh, and this period, you know, is kind of uh, has the, the most heavy influence from Western uh, culture into, into the gardens, right? So these gardens are, are now found mostly uh, in large cities, you know, like this garden here is in Tokyo, right? And one thing these gardens try to do, right, is that they try to create a very, a very natural scape. So as you walk to the gardens, they're designed to, from your proportion, right, to hide things like this, you know, like the buildings. So as you walk here, you feel like you're part of the garden, but you don't see any tall buildings or you don't see other features that might distract you. So if you follow the paths that are made through the garden, uh, some parts review the views, other parts hide the views. But these are more, let's see, um, they're not so uh, so strict, right? Like this garden here, you're meant to follow only the paths, right, of the gardens, right? Other gardens, like here, follow the paths. This garden here is I can follow the path to get to the space, right? Other gardens, so before, like here, you're not meant to go in the garden. So all these gardens were very controlled. You can see, but you cannot walk, or you can walk, but only through a control path. Same here, you can walk through a control path, you can walk through a control path. And once we get to the latest gardens, what, what, what do you think is the main difference? Now that they're more Western gardens in influence, what do you think changes in, in the, the experience of the, the gardens? Let's take a guess. Well, come on, guys, don't hide from the uh, to the sunk. Just look at the slide and what do you guys think? Let's see. How about Saida? What I think about the picture. No, no. What do you think about the uh, the approach to how the garden is used? I think they used it like connecting with the city. Okay. But what about the control that we saw in the previous gardens? It could be anyone in class, right? What do you see has changed now that we go to, uh, you know, the most recent period in Japan? Um, I can say that <clears throat> there's definitely way less control. Um, yes, you don't you don't have to follow any path. Like there's paths for you to follow, but technically you can be on both sides. Um, compared to like the Japanese gardens, it's it's very like restricted to like where you can really go. Exactly. Um, yes, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you yeah. go to Central Park, right, you can definitely, there's plenty of paths you can take, right? But you can also get off the path, right? For the most, you know, and you can go on the grass, right? Uh, you know, this garden, you know, combines, you know, certain paths, of course, very traditional. And then you see people just hanging out here in the lawn, right? The lawn typically was a place that you never went to, right? It was kind of restricted, right? Uh, that was that open space that we saw, you know, that was sand or water, or, uh, or you had small paths. So here, people can freely go anywhere. And of course, you know, the, 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 the modern garden is definitely more uh, more place to actually enjoy uh, than before, right? Before you can enjoy it as, a, as an actual, as a view, right? Now you can enjoy as a place. So you can go there, you can sit under the tree, uh, wherever you want, right? And you can still get an idea of the Japanese gardens. But again, some of the rules have become definitely less strict, right? Also other Japanese gardens, you know, like this one here, um, also, you can see this building right here. This building uh, was built in the early 1860s, right? And this is when the Western culture just, you know, arrived in Japan. And Japan always has been very eager to adapt to uh, Western culture, right? So when they arrived, you know, and they say in the 1800s to Japan, uh, a lot of the, a lot of things changed, including how they dress, you know. Most traditional uh, clothing are those kimonos, right, you wear or the one the men wear called yukata. So when the Western culture arrived, how did men start dressing? What do you guys think? 
what became the, the new style of dress for uh, Japanese? What do you guys think? How do Japan? How do uh, Western businessmen dress? Suit and tie. Yep, exactly. So once uh they arrived at you know they brought that dress code you know or that dress fashion and it became adopted in Japan uh right away. So the new style was dressing like a you know with a suit, a tie, those things. And the same thing with the buildings. You know this building is in Japan, right? Uh, there's nothing Japanese about this building. Uh, first of all, it's made out of masonry, right? It has shutters. It has typical windows. It has a European roof. It had those kind of elements here. Uh, and these buildings uh, became adopted pretty fast in Japan. And of course, these buildings didn't look good with a Japanese garden, so they had to also adopt the Western-style gardens. Uh, and these buildings, even though uh, they look okay, right? Uh, one thing that's really bad about them is they don't function in the Japanese climate. Uh, you know, coming from European uh, cultures, uh, these buildings, first of all, uh, they don't breathe, right? They're just solid, you know. So uh, so in summer, where, where Japan is extremely hot and extremely humid, these are buildings that are extremely hot and uh, uncomfortable to be in. So aesthetically, they might look interesting, but functionally, they don't work in the Japanese uh, uh, weather. And this happened a lot through, uh, through these, uh, you know, these times in, in Japan. All right, so let's uh, this is another very simple garden. I forgot where I saw it, but uh, it's you know, um, super simple, right? In the way that creates a little mountain here with the stones. <clears throat> so let's go, yeah. So, again, one thing is the Japanese garden says they evolved through the influence, right? Or the function of uh, what they're doing, whether it's farming, uh, then influenced by, by Buddhism, then by uh, Zen philosophy, Chinese cultures. Uh, Western culture, all these things have shaped Japanese gardens uh, throughout its uh, its time, right? You know, this is the uh, Ryoanji Garden, right? And, you know, for the most part, you know, right now, if you go to Japan, the ones that you see pretty often uh, is the dry gardens, right? So they typically they have, you know, red gravel, rocks, they're very minimal in uh, in design. They're very symbolic, right? Uh, and this is the most famous one, which is the Ryoanji Garden. Another one is Saihoji, which is Kokodera, which is the moss garden. So this one, you know, uh, you guys know this one, right? It's very, very famous garden. Uh, it's just, this is just simplicity, right? When I look at this, you know, you can stare here and having the, all this open space allows your eye to relax, right? Or to be able to just uh, uh, kind of de-stress uh, with these things. So again, like other gardens, this garden has a very large uh, almost like balcony, right? Has a, a first layer where you can walk, and a second layer that you can sit, right? And then a third layer where you can put put your feet down, right? So it gives you, uh, you know, a place to just you know relax. Oops, the way the garden is made here, right? It's simply just um, gravel, right? And it's trying to mimic mountains and other uh, landscapes. So I had a video to show you guys. Let's see here. Probably not here. So this is a good video here. Uh, of the, this is so this is what happens, you know, maybe once a week, right, in the garden. So you have one of the temple monks that goes in the garden, and he'll be here for quite a bit, you know. He first will rake the entire garden, and he'll try to get everything flat, you know, because you know during time. Uh, it could be wind or something. Everything becomes uh, uneven. So he first has to kind of uh, remove the old design that was made before. So he's raking away, you know, uh, all these little details. And this is just a typical rake, you know, nothing special here. It's just to uh, remove the old pattern from the design. And again, this might take a long time, but again, it's all just part of, you know, meditation. So you can see here all the, the lines from the old one. And now he's kind of making a blank slate to uh to start again. And also, what is he picking out as he as he moves there? What do you guys think? Any dirt that might occur. Yeah, any dirt, you know, any what happened here? Okay, advertisement. 
So yeah, he'll pick up any dirt, you know, any any leaves, uh, maybe something growing, right? Like a piece of moss that doesn't belong there. A piece of moss is starting to grow in the um, in the sand. All those things get removed, you know. And it's only one person. You know? There's not like a group of monks here working on this garden uh, the whole time. So he might take hours just to break everything into a blank slate without even starting to uh, to create the new design. Also, you can see here at this point, he's leaving behind all his footsteps here. You can kind of see them throughout here. While the final design will have no footsteps anywhere. And just picking up small stuff. And I'm not going to make you guys watch the whole 10 minutes of this video. But you see there, some of these kind of rocks that are white, somehow they, they end up being on top here. So He's removing any rocks that are in the wrong place. Right? You can see also now this is during spring, so you can see the cherry blossoms on the left side. And you can see here the three steps of this kind of balcony space. All right, so this is now the rake they use. This rakes, you know, they, they have different sizes. Uh, it's simply a wood rake with a, a wooden, uh, almost like fork structure. And this now creates the final pattern. So for, for this part, he has to be very careful not to leave any footprints. So he has to always walk backwards, right? And this is a very kind of meditative you know, process. So although this garden looks really extremely simple, right? Actually, it takes a lot of work to to keep it this way, right? A lot of patience, I would say. Yeah. These things are a bit more difficult, right? Because you're trying to make a uh, almost like the waves of the uh, of the ocean. So he do different patterns. You know, in the beginning, you see that he's just trying to get the rocks in the right place. So then he'll go over it a couple times until he gets the right size waves. Or sometimes they can switch to a different size rake to make it more pronounced. And again, he's being very careful to watch out for um, footprints. But this is pretty cool because you can see that this uh, looks almost like a mountain, right? You know, the peaks of the mountain, uh, you know, the lower parts. And now we're kind of almost like early afternoon. So he's been here kind of the whole day uh, doing this. And they'll create, you know, different patterns, you know, um, it could be once a week or so. What do you guys think of this, uh, this process here? It's very time consuming and like very precise. I keep thinking about like once he's going to be done. You think it's interesting or you think it's uh, too much for, for this garden? What do you guys think? I mean, it has a purpose, so I don't think it's really. I can hear you, but very, very far away. I think somebody was talking. Oh, um, can you hear me? I hear yeah, like I a whisper. I was trying. I was talking. Can you hear me now? Can somebody else speak just to to uh, make sure it's not my headphones? Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you by like a faint whisper. Can uh, anyone... let me see. Oh, um, Vanessa, are you there? I could hear you clear. Yeah, but... I could hear you. It's just that I don't know if you're hearing us. Probably you, Professor. Yeah, I can't hear you like a whisper. I'm just trying to see if anybody else can talk to make sure that it's not my headphones. All right. Denisha, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, so it also seems to be like a faint. You guys can hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, I don't know why my headphones are looking like a, like a whisper. Let me just make sure they're plugged in correctly. How about now? Yeah. Okay, much better. Yes, no, I can hear you. I right, go ahead, please. Well, yes, now I can hear you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, no, I was just saying that although it may be a lot of like 
um time consuming i think it has a purpose as to why it's taking so long like it's very tedious and very important because yes. it's used to you know to sit down and enjoy the view and then yes. also meditate so which is like a huge part of um, japanese culture so i think it's very important and very interesting as well okay Yes, so because it relates to all the the Zen, right, and the meditative view, then it makes sense, you know, um, in a way, you know, even though, um, and sometimes, you know, when you say this gardening is very simple, it's not really simple, right? Uh, simple is just what you see, you know, you don't see all the time that was spent, you know, selecting every piece of rock you know, to have the, the right shape, right? Uh, how they're spaced together, right? All these things, you know, are deep thinking into this garden, right? So um, although it's meant to look simple, uh, oh, here's a good thing, yeah. So how often do you to draw the pattern here? Early morning. And he's the, the chief priest there, yeah. So one thing here, you see how there's a cherry tree over here? Here, right? So let's say during autumn, when the leaves fall down or when the all the petals fall down, all those petals, you know, they fall down here, right? On the uh, on the rock. So those petals actually have to be picked up because eventually uh, in the beginning when they fall down, you know, they look pink, they look very nice, but eventually they just rot, you know, so they turn brown. So those petals have to be picked up very carefully uh, without trying to disturb too much of the, uh, you know, of, of the of the garden. So that's a key thing that's very important, you know, uh, with nature. Also, if we do it too often, right, uh, like he said, you know, the, the rocks become sand and it becomes more difficult to uh, to move afterwards. Yes, and then you, you have to do it, you know, on a daily basis. I think that's... I just trying to fix my, my headphones because, uh, okay. So this is a good question you know, that we're asking this monk here. So one thing that's very important about the Sam philosophy here is the uh, the focus. And he's saying this right now, like you guys read here, is that the hardest thing is keeping the line straight because if you get distracted, what happens? The lines become wavy, right? So focus is kind of a, and that discipline of kind of, as you walk, you're only focused on the lines being straight. You're not thinking about anything else because sometimes in our culture, right? When we do work, we might be thinking about three or four other things, you know, in our mind. And the hard thing is to keep it so simple that you only focus on one thing, right? And that's the core philosophy of, you know, of Zen Buddhism, right? Is the focus on one uh, one element. All right, I think that's pretty good for this garden. Let's keep going here. Right. So this is, uh, and I'll assign this garden to a few students in class to uh, to look at. Another also very nice uh, sand garden is this one here called uh, Kongobu G. It's a Mount Koya. And this is a definitely more extensive garden, which requires a lot more maintenance, just because almost the entire garden of this building is a sand garden, right? And there's you know massive stones all throughout here in the space. And you can see the amount of work to try to, uh, to keep everything straight. You can see that there's a lot of leaves here that need to be maintained. So it requires a lot more work, something to speak, right? But in this case, the garden kind of surrounds the entire building. 
and the building, you know, has different views of the garden, right? Another very beautiful garden here, which actually is more simple here. This is the, this building is called the Ginkakuji, which is the silver pavilion in Japan. And the garden here, you can see this is this one shot over the garden. And they make this beautiful mount here of the garden here. And that's always there. What do you think this represents? Knowing Japanese, you know, and those things, what do you think this, this big uh, element uh, showcases? What element of Japan? Would it be the mountains? Mountain. Oh. Yeah, but which mountain in specific? What What is the most famous mountain in Japan? Mount Fuji? Yeah, exactly. Mount Fuji, right? So this shows cases, you know, Mount Fuji, right? Uh, and this is just made of completely just sand, right? So uh, I haven't seen it when they build it because it's hard to, uh, but uh, it's kind of unique, you know? And you can see that uh, this garden, first of all, it's kind of a, a mound, right? Look here. So it's about a foot and a half off the ground, right? All sand, right? And it's raked in, you know, this very unique pattern. This looking at one side, and from the other side, you see this kind of mound, and across it, you see the, uh, the Mount Fuji, right? So it's kind of unique, you know, and I also will assign this garden as a for you guys to to look at, right? And to try to uh, you know look at the history and kind of tell us uh, why is this shape like this, you know? Another nice garden, and I, before I show you guys this one, is it has this kind of nice uh, window here, right? Which is called the flower window, but it has also a very unique uh, garden that is on both sides of the window here, including this over here, right? What do you think this shape is when you look at that? And this garden is found at Dai Sen in Sen Garden. But this is meant to imitate a boat, right? So we have a boat here, right? We have the, uh, I guess, the ocean here with the waves, right? And from here, you get a nice, perfect view of the, of the, uh, the boat. From the other side, this part here, is another pretty elaborate uh, landscape. This garden, you can tell that it's very small, right? This is the, the wall between this and the other temple, uh, another wall over here. And it's just kind of tall kind of landscapes. And this is kind of made to imitate one of the typical kind of Chinese mountainscapes or Chinese paintings, where you have kind of tall mountains and different elements happening through the mountain. And obviously at the base is the, uh, the water. It's not a detail, you can see this, uh, rock is shaped like a boat here in the design. And you see, it's very small, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe eight feet across is the entire garden. Another garden, this is a Kom Yosenji garden. Uh, again, has a bunch of rocks, right? They might look random, but, you know, when you guys look at this temple, you know, see if you can find out why uh, they are in those, you know, locations, right? And other ones, you know, are kind of more this is actually the same location. This is one garden in this building. And uh, it has a, this one has a few gardens throughout the, the complex. This is the one that is kind of flowing through the landscape. So this is very uh, natural. This is very controlled, right? In a way that is, you know, everything here is almost like hardscapes, the wall, the pavings, uh, the architecture. Well, here, the boundaries are now fairly simple, right? So you have all the, the moss and definitely some control elements of, uh, of landscapes, mountains. And we still have the idea of the rake uh, sand here, which actually is more difficult here because you're dealing with all these different circles and curves here uh, and patterns that are starting to overlap in the space. So this is looking kind of more of the uh, rock gardens in the space. The next garden that we have, you know, are called the Tsukiyama. So Tsukiyama gardens are hill gardens and pond gardens. These are typically much larger in space, and they'll feature hills, ponds, bridges, islands. Uh, and the aim here is to create a, a scenic, beautiful, and tranquility in the view, right? This is one of the gardens here. You can see that it's a whole different scale of space, right? So these gardens are, although you can walk to them in some part, they are made to be enjoyed from a certain location. So in this case, from inside this building here, you're meant to enjoy the view because as you walk this, let's say over here, you might not catch the uh, 
the exact view the designer wanted to see. So once you're in here and you look at it, you're going to see the exact kind of curves here of the mountains, right? And it's all about creating very soft looking landscapes. Then we have, you know, the, the bottom, the second layer will be the, uh, the rocks. And then we have the water. So uh, those three layers. And the idea here is to create a very complex space through layers, right? So we have, let's say, the foreground, the middle ground, and the background. And as you put them together, they start to merge together and create other landscapes. That's the same location, right? A bit more complex, uh, more stuff happening, but we can see still the layering of elements or this kind of curving in space of different things. The same location from a different view, right? And this is just, in a way, this is almost like perfection, right? In the uh, in the landscape, because everything is so perfect that it looks almost fake, right? You know, like these hills, right? Are perfectly smooth, right? The way the grass grows, uh, the way that this uh, hedges are, are trimmed, you know, perfectly curved elements here. Uh, even the rocks that are between them, it creates a nice kind of more playful uh, design in the space. And do you think I'm allowed to walk in these gardens? What do you guys think? No. No, right. So these are just meant to be seen, right? They're too, uh, too perfect. You know, of course, you know, somebody might go there to maintain them, but that's the only person that can go there. So these are more like paintings, right? Something that you see, you step back, but you're never actually allowed to um, to walk there. Others ones here, also, you know, different hills, pond gardens, you know, will also introduce color. You can see that we have some red elements here, right? Kind of some highlights of uh, of for the eye. Then we have, you know, some pink here for the uh, cherry blossoms during spring, right? And then we have also, in other parts, we have highlights for the um, uh, for the autumn, right? So all these things, you know, are definitely so. Although color is not really a big part of Japanese gardens, they do appear in the much bigger gardens once it start to bring kind of a that Western influence of the space, right? And here, of course, and for Japan, you know, first of all, uh, the seasons have a unique, uh, distinct color. When you think of autumn, you think about these colored, you know, trees here. When you think of spring, you think about the pink cherry blossoms. And when you think, and um, I think between autumn and spring, we get this beautiful red uh, elements here that also kind of pop in the space. So these colors also signify the change of time and the change of seasons in Japan. And of course, the water just makes everything look much, much nicer in the space. Let's see, yes. And this is another one in Hiroshima, Japan. Again, these are larger gardens with larger features of, of elements in the space. You know, you can see again the idea of highlighting a bigger uh, kind of hillside of the space. This is a, a, a castle in the background. So we have again, uh, so this is starting now to go, it's, it's still a hill and pond garden, but it's, it's starting to go into the straw gardens uh, where we started to ex experience kind of freely moving through the space. But of course, you can see here that there's boundaries to all these elements. So they don't want anybody crossing these boundaries uh, and actually stepping on the grass or anywhere in this sense. Let's see, I think I had also one for that. No, that's that one. So there are several of these. Uh, so it's like this one here also. So this is during autumn. So with autumn, you know, you get all the colors, you know, you can see here the, the koi fish uh, through here. And this is why the water is typically very shallow here. So you can see the fish kind of just flowing through that, through the space. Uh, we see all the rocks here, you know, that the paths are kind of very natural to the space. The lighting is definitely beautiful, these gardens. Go a little faster here. And you can see, you know, there are paths here, right? Oops. And there's still, uh, there's like wires here, so that no one is going to veer off the path. And one thing we discussed before, right, is the path over here is fairly flat, but look at this path over here, right? You're stepping between these stones, right? So what did I discuss before the idea of these stones, you know, how do they control you? How does the shape of the path affect your experience of the space? 
it slows you down so you can look around exactly so by having the this kind of pretty rough stones you know they're pretty big here someone's taking out more you're forced to look down right uh and look at the past so even though there's a nice view here you know you're looking down here and eventually you're going to end up you know in a different path that maybe is more flat at that point you can pick up your eyes and you look around in the space here So even the cameraman, you, you can see he's kind of jumping around uh, with the uh, the view. So ideally here, you should be looking down as you walk through all these details. And you see, again, more boundary here between this kind of sand garden and the other one. And again, these boundaries, you know, are, are not really traditional uh, uh, in a sense, you know. These are kind of more to prevent people nowadays from trying to jump over the, you know, going there just because a lot of people tend to ignore uh, those elements. I won't go to the whole garden here, but I wanna see different stages here. Like here, you see this path goes from a very bouncy rock, pretty uncomfortable to walk in, to a much more uh, softer flat area in the garden. It's a lot of the same thing here. So this is kind of unique yeah, because you're walking up the, uh, you know, not the mountain, but you get the sense of uh, of different levels. You know, some paths are kind of like bridges that we saw, right? And one thing you can see here is the water becomes almost like a mirror. You have red here, orange, you know, green, everything reflected over the, uh, uh, the space here. I think this is more the same thing. All right, let's keep going to the other one. So now that we're looking at this kind of, and again, these are hill gardens and pond gardens. And this is kind of a, a later gardening addition, again, influenced by Western culture. Uh, they started to combine Western ideas with traditional ideas here. And these hills of pond gardens, they might have multiple gardens within the whole complex. So the main garden might be like a hill garden like this that has multiple things. But then you see this bridge here, right? Goes to a little tea house, right? So now this tea house might have a small tea garden inside the space here. Or if you walk somewhere else, you might reach a sand garden. So there are multiple things, you know, uh, that are maybe housed within the same complex. So let's look at, you know, something like this, you know, a tea, a tea garden is probably the most basic garden you're going to find, you know. So, you know, obviously a tea house is there for holding tea ceremony. And they usually include a tea house, you know, where you have the ceremonies. Uh, the style of the garden avoids any suggestion of, uh, of showiness. So you're not trying to showcase, you know, whether you're rich or you have anything. It's just meant to be neutral, right? And it strives to be the utmost uh, simplicity, right? And to show, uh, you know, um, a link to nature, right? So there's often stepping stones leading to the tea house. Uh, there's stones, lanterns, a stone basin to wash your hand. Uh, and overall, super simple, right? So, and they prepare that. So in a way, when you get to a tea garden, it's so simple that, you know, your mind starts to prepare for the tea ceremony, right? That includes uh, those elements. This is, you know, again, a very simple uh, tea house. And the garden is pretty much just this, you know, so you have maybe the entrance here, right? Going through this kind of bridge, right? You have the idea here of crossing something. This could be like a river. Uh, and then you have, you know, a few things that are here, right? So these are some doors that can open up left and right here. That's the entrance. So when you go here, you have to, again, bow down and go through this very small door. And then inside here, you can fit maybe two, maybe three people inside there. And then the tea master will open these doors here and reveal a very small sliver of this garden here. And again, this garden is completely uh, lacking all, let's say, luxury, right? There's no, uh, you know, uh, color, right? Typically, color always looks very fancy or definitely looks very luxurious. Uh, it's just uh, everything is simple, right? You will have, you know, a bridge here, uh, a light, right? A uh, lantern here, and that's pretty much it, you know. Another small garden here is, uh, this is the gateway to enter. You walk through this kind of stepping stones, you get to a, a plinth here, and then you enter the tea house. This actually, this is a, a very famous uh, tea house in Oregon, in Portland. 
Uh, it's called the Kashin Tei. So this tea house was um was built in Japan completely and then shipped to uh to Oregon and then put together here by Japanese uh, uh craftsmen craftsmen that were flown into the the space here. So when you go inside here, right? So this this tea house it's a little bit Western and uh, and Japanese in style. Uh, you have the elevated path here, which is the uh, the tea room here. You have a lower path here where you can walk on, right? And all through here, you know, and let's say 360, you have views of the, the, the garden, right? The space. And then we have, you know, the straw gardens. But before we get to that, let's see here. Like here. This is a, a, a tea garden. I, I know it's showing the photograph is one thing, but sometimes it's better to see it, you know, um, through, a, through a video, let me find here. So this is kind of your approach to a tea garden, right? And you can see that compared to everything that we've seen here, uh, there's pretty much nothing there, right? It's so simple that uh, you really, uh, it looks like it's completely almost uh, just uh, nature is the one who designed it. Right? Besides these stepping stones, right? That's the only really sense of direction you have to get to your tea room or tea house. So right now, which garden you are you liking the most? What do you guys think? Um, I honestly like the hill and pond ones the most. <laughs> okay. And what things do you like about those gardens? Because it's just uh, like, it's just pleasing to the eye. Like okay. you can definitely, I definitely see myself just sitting there and just like thinking about life and just, you know, enjoying what's around me. Yes. I think th those are definitely the ones that are, because, you know, they're, they're vast, you know, there's so much happening. It, it is like a, a living painting, right? Of, of this garden that it's always has movement. The tea gardens, like this one here, it's somebody might say that is, I don't know, boring, that is ugly, right? Uh, that is missing any any aesthetics in the garden, right? It's just simply uh, neutral, right? And it's meant to be neutral, right? The other ones, like the hill gardens, are meant to be flashy and showy, and they, you know, they highlight different elements or colors, right? Uh, yeah, again, any any place you look here it looks almost the same, right? The same lighting, everything's kind of green. Uh, dark shadows. And like I said before, you know, there's the tea room and there's the tea house. And those will discuss in more detail in a different lecture. But let's say um, a tea room where you go there to prepare uh, for tea ceremony, you don't really care about the uh, the garden. So the garden is not meant to be uh, a view from the building. It's just there to uh, to allow your mind to uh, to rest, you know, before you go to tea ceremony. Once you go to like a tea house, right? Then the garden is the view for the guests, right? So that garden is definitely more, let's say showy. It has more details and it's more elegant, right? Than this one here. This is just to, it's just there to relax your mind before you enter. So you have, you know, water feature, right? This thing here that's always dripping water, right? It's still, you know, this garden is still very difficult to maintain, even though it looks simply, uh, you know, very simple. They'll also have this in, in the uh, in the space here. So I know it's very dark here, but it's a uh, it's a sitting area. So when the guests come into the to this uh, area, they take a path, you know, and they first arrive here, right? And they all sit here, right? And this is facing the garden. So before they even get to the tea ceremony, they have to sit here and look at the garden and kind of. Uh, uh, relax their mind or get ready for the tea ceremony, right? Uh, and again, they're trying to become more humble because once you enter a tea room, uh, no matter your status, everyone's the same, right? We have equal status. So it's kind of, you sit here, you start to look at the garden, you kind of leave behind all your, you know, whatever you were, you know, outside the gates here. You know, you, you were, I don't know, somebody famous, somebody rich, uh, all that stays behind here. And you cannot prepare your mind before you get to the tea uh, room and do, of course, the tea ceremony. And you have different rooms through here. Another area here. You can see another waiting area here. You can sit here. 
and you get a nice view of the garden from here. So a typical tea room will always have a, a waiting area before you actually get to the stepping stone step here and then enter the space for the tea ceremony. And then after here, it's pretty much the same. Uh, another, this is just different tea rooms. So later we'll talk about, you know, this person here, uh, Kobori Enshu. So he's one of Jap more, Japan's most famous uh, tea masters. And I, I kind of focus my, uh, my doctorate uh, on this person. So later on, we'll look at more of one of his famous buildings in a lot more detail and his style of, uh, of uh, tea ceremony. And yeah, that's all very simple for the tea gardens. Nothing as fancy as the other ones. All right. So the next type of gardens, you know, and this is pretty much, uh, this is the strolling gardens, right? So these, these here are meant to kind of explore uh, and walk around. So designed to be leisurely walks and relaxation, uh, meandering paths, lead visitors through various scenic areas. Uh, they feature, again, ponds, bridges, uh, landscapes. Um, the most famous example is the Katsura Villa uh, in Korakuen Garden. So this is a picture of the Katsura Villa. Uh, so this is one of Japan's kind of most famous architectural, you know, let's say locations here. And uh, a lot of the famous architects, this is the, the building that they saw when they went to Japan. So let's say Frank Lloyd Wright was here. Uh, Mies van der Rohe went here. Le Corbusier went here. And they were taking, and this is kind of the, where they, they started to become interested in Japanese architecture and the aesthetics of the gardens versus the uh, the buildings. Uh, this building is a, it is a massive complex of uh, tea rooms, tea houses, and bigger, you know, kind of uh, living quarters. Uh, it has gardens that mimic different scenes of the of Japan, and and these can be enjoyed through different paths. Uh, and certain paths, you know, will uh, will showcase different views of the space, right? You can see another one here. You know, the bridges here, the shores, the very shallow water. Uh, how, using these stones here to mimic the uh, uh, the rocks at the border of, uh, let's say, a lake, for example. And we have kind of this, uh, this is kind of the rock complex. So if you ever go here, it is, it's like a day trip and you, you, you can walk all through here, right? And these paths go, you know, along here, along here. And you can cross here to different areas. And one thing that's important here is all this vegetation there is there for a reason, because as you walk to the paths, they're meant to hide and showcase different elements of the uh, of the gardens. So you don't see everything always at the same time. You see things little by little uh, that are being showcased. Let's see, and I have also one of this one. Katsura, yes. So this is the Katsura Villa. So when you first enter here, it's fairly simple, right? You don't see much of the actual water, right? So all the views are kind of controlled in the uh, in the space here. And you see also here, one. so Katsura Villa is located um, in Kyoto. So Kyoto is, uh, it's still at a location that we still get snow there. So we, we have the four seasons, uh, almost like, in, like, like here, like New York. But what's, does this look like a vegetation for, let's say for, uh, our climate. What do you guys think? What does this look like when you look at these elements here? I feel like it looks tropical. Mm -hmm. Exactly, because this garden here, this whole complex uh, of gardens, is meant to mimic different parts of Japan. So this first part is meant to mimic the uh, the southern part of Japan. That's very tropical weather. So they have these kind of palm trees. Uh, they grow here, right? And it requires immense care because in winter they have to be wrapped for, you know, for the cold and for the snow. But uh, you start kind of capturing different views of different parts of Japan from the very, you know, down south areas like uh, Hiroshima, uh, all the way to north, let's say to other parts. Oh, this is not too interesting here. But once you get here, right, this, um, so this is one of the, the tea houses that are in place here. So we have here designated paths. So th this is still a very traditional. So you can't really walk anywhere you want. You have to stay to the path uh, here. 
and if, even some of these paths, you know, you can't walk anymore because uh, they're meant for, you know, somebody more, uh, let's say, famous. But you might see here, let's see here, it's a good shot here. And this path, oops. There, there are a lot of things here. So look at this hedge here, right? That's very tall. So as you walk here, it's kind of blocking your view, right? Uh, because as you walk here, you're not meant to see everything uh, right away. It's meant to be revealed to you little by little as you walk around the space. And we have things like a peninsula, right? With a lighthouse there. So th this kind of combines a bit of everything, you know, a hill garden, pond garden, straw gardens, all into just one large you know, complex. We have the, the koi fish there for, you know, for viewing area. That's your color to the garden. Like here, I can look at the stepping stones, you know, very, they actually look pretty uncomfortable to walk on, right? So if I was looking forward, you know, I would definitely fall down through these steps. So in a way you're keeping the eyesight down until you get to the bridge, right? The bridge becomes a very um, simple uh, flat area. So you keep your eye down and once you get to the bridge, you, you're, you look up and you can kind of see the full view. And if you, um, yeah, so again, it's going back to the control of the uh, the person in the space. And if you look at now, let's look at it here. Um, so in Japan, you know, so the more of the Western gardens are used now for, let's say celebration. So if I look here for uh, cherry, no, uh, Japan, right? And think of uh, so what happens in Japan during these things, you know. So cherry blossoms, you know, obviously are a huge thing in, in Japan. Okay. Yeah. And right now, you know, do you have crowds of Japanese, you know? Uh because you know it, it's beautiful, right? You have, you know, massive uh, amounts of cherry trees, uh, and they start to blossom different, you know, different times in Japan, you know. So if you ever go to Japan in March, April. Uh, you know, there's festivals happening every week, you know, to highlight, you know, the cherry blossoms. Uh, and this is uh, in Tokyo, right? So all the parks that you can do activities. So these are now kind of more Western style parks, you know, with little boats that you can, that you can rent uh, in here. And let me, so this is what happens, right? Exactly here. So in Japan, you know, you go to cherry blossoms, you know, uh, and you just hang out, right? So, uh, and these are now parks, you know, these are more like Western parks, but you can go anywhere in these uh, in these parks, right? There's really no, uh, sorry, no limitation here. And during cherry blossoms, you know, you um, you kind of go there after work every day while there's still kind of cherry blossoms here and you just hang out uh, under the trees. You, you do the kind of picnics every single day and it's called Hanami. Hanami means uh, cherry uh, cherry viewing or the, uh, the, the flower viewing. And people just go there and just uh, drink and and eat, right? Every single day, you know, after work, you know, hang out in parks. Uh, again, you know, it's, it's a bit crowded now, so it's not maybe as pleasant as before. And you have all this kind of, you know, Western things that, you know, uh, enjoy the, uh, uh, this is within uh, Tokyo. So when I was living there, you know, we, we used to go through all these different parks, you know, Shinjuku, Tokyo here. Uh, for these kind of chair, but yeah, again, you can walk anywhere. So this is now almost like Central Park uh, in these things here. Let's see. Anyone ever been to like a cherry blossom festival? It could be at the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens, Washington, D.C. Um, I don't know. Have you guys ever been to it? Anyone? I've always wanted to go. Okay, but maybe not... in the future. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So again, these are also happening, you know, um, a bunch of times here, and you can see how crazy they get with these festivals here. Uh, if you go to Kyoto, it's a it's a beautiful area to uh, to view, and you can see, it, you know, when you live in there, 
you get kind of announcements every day as to which park, you know, it's at the peak of the cherry blossoms. So you can go there. And then in the evening, at night, you have festivals, right? Uh, where they light up, the, you know, the cherry trees, you know, uh, lanterns. So it's a pretty cool atmosphere to be uh, to be enjoying this kind of very, you know, Western gardens. And again, you can see that it's free, right? There's no, there's no really order. It's just gonna go wherever you want, relax, enjoy uh, the landscapes. And it does get this crazy, right? Um, and everyone does kind of drink every day um, in the parks and eat pretty much. This is the uh, uh, the sky tree in Japan. It was built a couple, I think like five years ago, it was built. Let's see, what's another park? So these are all... Oh, this is the another park. This is the Studio Ghibli Park, where they have all the statues of, uh, of the uh, the movies. That's a cool shot here, I guess. So this kind of you know covers a a good amount you know of the parks that you know that are kind of typical in Japan, right? Uh, you can see that some of them are more you know, traditional. Some of them are 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 focused towards that's it only tea ceremony. Some of them are there for, uh, for their painting like effect. You know, so uh, and they serve as a living painting. And then the ones towards the end, you know, are more for the enjoyment of the people, right? And doing kind of whatever they want there. You know, depending on the season. So you can see how they adapt, how they change the gardens. You know, to create all these different you know elements in the space. All right, so that's uh that's you know that'll be that part there of the lecture. Any questions? No questions, or you guys clear? I'm clear. Yeah. I'm clear. Okay, I see a few chats here. Uh, Michelle, um, were you trying to talk? I just saw your chat there. Oh, that was earlier when you're okay. Over that and stuff. Thank you. Okay. All right. So let, let's look here at, uh, at what you guys are going to present here. Let me see. Uh, screen one. All right. You can see this, right? Yeah. Okay. Let me just see where I have this saved here. So let's talk about the assignment here. And I'll give you also some samples from last semester to look at. Or first, let me just open it up here. Okay. So this part you guys can see, right? Yeah. Okay, good. All right, so let me, uh, one sec, let me get something else. Okay. So, okay. So this would be, you know, our first project in class, you know, and, you know, the class projects in this class are going to be presentations, right? Or your kind of understanding. So I want to ask you guys to, to present a topic that we haven't discussed. So now that we've kind of spent, you know, let's say two classes discussing, you know, Japanese gardens and those things. Now, you know, um, I want you guys to do a little bit of, you know, uh, more research, you know, on a specific location, right? That you guys will later present to the class in, you know, let's say about 10 minutes, you know, uh, presentation. And we'll have, you know, um, we'll see how many, we might have four or five during the semester on different topics that we discuss, you know, ranging from uh, Japanese gardens to uh, tea houses, to shrines, temples, and, and so on uh, throughout here. So, so uh, this gives you a pretty good detail here. So we, we've discussed, you know, all the different garden types in our lectures, right? Uh, so it aims to, uh, the, to gain understanding of you know, the garden design, the location, the vegetation, relationship with architectural structures, seasonal changes, and the user experience, you know, even layout, you know, how do these things. So when you look at your presentation, right, uh, you know, you're going to have your garden. So I, I will assign the garden this time. I won't let you guys pick, but I will assign you guys either a, a dry garden, a tea garden, uh, or like a stroll or hill garden, one of those uh, garden types, you know, 
uh, you would do some research on that specific garden, right? Uh, that you're being uh, given, right? And look at some of the historical parts, you know, uh, you know, design uh, elements. You will make a design person. You'll make a presentation, which could be a PowerPoint or PDF. You know, uh, it shouldn't long be longer than ten minutes. I think that's enough because we have a uh, we have eighteen students, so that gives us plenty of time to go through everyone in one one class. And then I'll give you guys here what things in specific to look at for that presentation. So design, right? So again, for your garden, right? This, discuss the garden's layout, uh, architectural features, and any unique design elements that make it distinct. Location, explain the garden's uh, you know, location within Kyoto or anywhere it might be, uh, and how the garden contributes to, the, to, to its ambience. Uh, vegetation, so describe the types of vegetation, right? Uh, using a garden and their significance, right? So are they using like uh, things in the, in the foreground, the middle ground, the background? Is there any color in the, in the gardens? Uh, what trees are they using? Are, are the trees there for any purpose? Are they trying to block other views? Whatever you see that you can understand, uh, explain here. Uh, relation to nearby architectural structure. So is the garden in front of a, of a building, right? Uh, explain how the garden interacts with nearby buildings or structures, including any temples, shrines, or tea houses. Uh, seasonal changes, right? Does your garden change during spring, uh, during autumn, right? Um, and how that, you know, um, how, you know, uh, the symbolism is associated with the garden, right? And then user, this is your take on the garden, your user experience. So by looking at this garden, by doing all the research, uh, analyze how the garden is meant to be experienced by visitors. So imagine you go in there, you know, um, uh, what do you, you know, discuss elements such as pathways, uh, viewing points and seating areas. Right? And uh, last one is that the layout visualization, right? So include a plan drawing. This could be by sketch, or maybe you can find one online, right? Uh, aerial views could be photographs, hand drawings, sketches, whatever you want to visualize some way that is organized. Uh, this could be very diagrammatic. Again, this is not meant to be a, a precise architectural drawing. It could be more like a diagram, right? To see how the garden is on, uh, analyzed it could be in relation to the uh, architecture, you know, such things. So try to address those points. I believe that will apply to any garden you pick. And last, you know, um, you can do, you know, PowerPoint, PDF. Uh, that will be submitted to the Dropbox folder before the next class. Uh, so I'm looking here for the, uh, the depth and accuracy of the research, right? Uh, clarity, is everything organized and how it's presented? And your just analysis of the space, you know, uh, everything that you're looking at. Uh, this will be due uh, on the 21st, which is the next class. We'll present that. Uh, again, make sure that it's not late. Uh, and then here, I already assigned kind of gardens to students. So we have here the whole class, right? So we have here uh, Saida. Some of the big gardens I gave them to two students. And these are, you know, um, it doesn't mean they have to work together. It's just... Um, you know, you guys can do the same thing and then you can present separately. This is because sometimes with a big garden, you might see different things um, than other students. So, so side that, you know, I give Katsura Villa. Vanessa has the uh, Komyo Yusen uh, Jin Garden in Fukuoka. And you can use this to copy and paste and you can search about that space. Michelle has a Kongo Buji Garden and, you know, and so on here. Some of the gardens are more modern, some are more traditional, some of them are in US, you know, if if you um if you get stuck in a garden, for example, and you and you told me that you can't find any information on it, you know, for some reason, then feel free to look for something else that is similar and just let me know, right? If you can't find something else, just send me an email and I'll find you a different garden to uh to research. But these are all famous gardens. So there should be plenty of information on all these gardens uh, online, right? And some of them are you know, sand gardens, some of them are straw gardens, some of them are hill, and a few are tea gardens, which are more simple. So everything should be here for you guys to uh, to look. And just to give an example of uh, where things were presented last class, let me give you a few samples here. So this was done by Javier. Uh, you guys might know him, Sarmiento. Uh, he did a tea garden. So, you know, this is kind of his uh, presentation. So he started by, you know, location, right? Where is the garden located, you know, here? Uh, you know, the end of the garden, uh, you know, the the the, uh, the name of this garden is Camellia, so based on the flower, right? Again, uh, interesting landmarks to approach there. 
uh, some of the some of the architecture nearby the garden. This one came up blurry. I don't know why. Okay, and then you know this is some of the seasonal awareness. So how the garden might look in winter, you know, in autumn, different seasons. Uh, some pictures of you know of the uh, of somebody you know in the garden, you know, doing tea ceremony with the views here. Uh, traditional strategies, uh, you know, of the garden could be the architecture details, uh, design and architecture. Tea ceremony. This garden is famous for tea ceremony. Uh, you know how tea ceremony is done, uh, and then some kind of details here of the. Uh, so this was he did the camellia tea ceremony place, and he gave you know some of these things details here. I'll give you guys a couple other ones to see. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Some of them are not loading. One second. Okay, this is another garden. Uh, this is by Shirley, and she did the uh, Keresan Sui Dry Garden. So again, uh, you can find great shots of the gardens. There's plenty of those. Some basic idea of location, where the garden is uh, there. Images here and kind of explaining, you know, your research, you know, on the garden. Different shots there. Like here, you know, this is a pretty cool shot, you know, saying the stones represent uh, dragon flying freely in the sky. So this, you know, with a bit of reading, you can understand those elements. The garden looks like night, different shots of the garden. That was her sketch of, of her understanding of this garden. So again, it's not meant to be anything uh, anything difficult for you guys to do. And just to uh, to have a good understanding of the gardens. Some of the PDFs do not open. Well, it looks like they only open through a second. Okay. Uh, this is a person who did a Katsura Villa that we just did. So they did a pretty good uh, presentation on the history of the Katsura Villa, you know, architecture, uh, styles there, and how it's you know, located, uh, all the buildings. A map of the space. You know, she went through all the different uh, uh like here, you know, this this is meant to represent, you know, um southern part of Japan. Then this garden here represents, you know, this kind of peninsula also in the south of Japan. This um uh, lantern here represents a lighthouse in Japan. So it starts to, you know, with her issue, she found out all those details and she did a pretty good presentation on uh on Katsura Villa. So again, uh, I have no limit on slides, you know, the key thing is, you know, you're talking for like 10 minutes. So, uh, I don't know, so maybe 19 slides is more than enough, uh, unless you want to showcase uh, more, but uh, I wouldn't say you don't need any more than 20 slides. Uh, that's probably uh, more than enough for, for this space. That's another student who also had Katsura Villa. She did a bit more research. She actually did a very good, uh, this is a, uh, uh, Keri. Uh, Keri did a pretty good uh, presentation on the Katsura Villa, you know, the overview history of the space. And, you know, for us, you know, like some of this, you know, it's good, but uh, because you're talking to the class, it's kind of more important to give just bullet points because what you don't want to do is when you go up there to present, you don't want to read this whole thing, right? Because that gets kind of boring, right? So it's better for you to look at this, maybe highlight three or four bullet points and you just talk about it, you know, because if you go up there to just read and read, then it's not really a good presentation. So again, plenty of features. She went through all the different lantern types that are there, uh, the architecture that's there, how it links to the gardens, vegetation, seasonal. So all those things that I asked, you know, in, in the questions she addressed here, seasonal changes, vegetation, architecture, and the, and the space. Let's see. Another person here, she did a, a Okochi Sanso, which is a different one. But again, nice location, views. So again, guys, look at the gardens that I, that I gave you guys. Um, if you look at it and you get stuck, let me know. If you think that is, that, you know, if you wanna do something else that you, you find to be maybe more interesting, 
that it still relates to the topics, then just let me know. I'll be happy to uh, to let you guys change the garden. Uh, but for now, try to do the, the ones I did, research them, and then let me know how it goes with those uh, with those elements. Does that make sense? Kind of the uh, kind of what I expect from these uh, you know presentations. Yeah. Yeah, shouldn't be too difficult, you know, it should be interesting. This is pretty cool, right? We have kind of a season, you know, let's say spring, autumn, winter. Uh, it's not always possible, but do your best to find those those things here. And let's see. And I think that's that's good, yeah. I think that's good for today. So uh, again, I'll copy this lecture into the Dropbox folder under lecture number three. On the assignments, I also copy the assignment sheet that we have here which should be this one here. And then you guys can uh, can get to work on this. And the next class on the 21st, you guys will uh, present, uh, uh, we'll spend the whole class presenting these uh, this garden things. And that'll be, you know, the first, you know, um, and then we'll move on to the next topic in the class uh, for the semester. Any Any questions? Anything confusing? Nope. No, you guys are Gustavo, are you good? Okay. Yep. Uh let me just check here. So in the attendance I have uh Gus oh Gustavo absent, but I see you there. You'll mark your present. Uh Axel. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, good. Uh and Kevin. Kevin, you there? Okay, so that's not bad. All right, guys. So then we'll finish here the class. You know, also I'll put a link to this video that we recorded today, also in the uh, YouTube. Uh, sorry, in the YouTube channel. I'll drop it to the Dropbox folder. All right, guys. Thank you very much. I'll see you guys uh, next class. Um, thank you. Take care. Thank you, guys. See you next week. Take care.